Crack them up, boys. All right. Um, we talked about uh, last week, and if you weren't here, uh, you can find it on the internet under Philippians, the introduction. And uh, we talked about the introduction. There's, there's one thing that I want to look at uh, or, or talk about regarding the introduction to Philippians. Um, and if you don't have a Spirit-Filled Life Bible, find one. Because it has, it's the only place I know that the introduction to Philippians is at. Um, something that's important to remember uh, in the introduction to Philippians Paul's whole uh, point in Philippians is joy. Remembering that this was probably written uh, during Paul's first imprisonment uh, before he was there to stay. And uh, so Paul probably had a, a real understanding of what it means to try to get joy. And try to stay in that place of joy. Remember we looked at uh, last week that the birth of the, the church in Philippi was in Acts chapter 16. And we all know that that's the place that Paul and Silas had been uh, whipped uh, and jailed. And uh, when, the, when they were praying and, the, and praising, remember the power of praise. It has the power to release you from any bonds of the enemy. Now, that doesn't just mean I can go along and not apply the word and I can praise and, and everything will be okay. What it means is when I walk and I live in what God's plan is for my life and I remain in joy because of that, then what will happen is I'll be released from whatever the enemy plans on for bad. Uh, we can look at, at different things. Um, you know, and, and uh, if I'm, and, and I'm, I'm not going to use anybody for an example, but there's two or three things that come to mind that the enemy has meant for bad in different people's lives that I even look around the room tonight and, and remember different things, whether it was financial attack, whether it was physical attack, whatever it was, the enemy meant for bad. And, and the Father says, you know what? Because you walk in, in my love, because you walk in my joy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you released from that. And I'm going to cause that bad plan of the enemy to turn to good for you. And so that's something to, to bear in mind as we go into... Uh, Philippians. We're probably going to only get a, a down through a, about half of this chapter tonight and simply because there's a lot of things that we need to look at as we go through. Uh, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in, in Christ Jesus who were in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. And I want to stop right there and I want to look at some meanings in this place. We, uh, the church today, uh, in many times, has a different concept of what biblical deacons were or what the bishops did. Uh, bishops simply means, and if you have a Spirit-Filled Life Bible and, and probably many others also, right there next to bishops, it has a number one. And when you look at that number one, it simply says that, that uh, they were overseers. So a bishop uh, was an overseer of the church in that place. Uh, for instance, and, and I'll give you an example. James, um, we'd, never, we'd never called him anything but the overseer of the, the uh, ministry in Nigeria. But the last time I was there, a guy looked at him and he said, Bishop James. And I, I realized right then what he did was he called him by the biblical name that uh, is simply means overseer. So we've uh, actually even on the signs that, that I showed you that are on the wells uh, that, that tell that it was done to the glory of Jesus Christ and the partners of uh, David Simmons Worldwide Ministries for Nigeria. It says Bishop James on there because that's what the Bible calls an overseer in that place. 
Um, but a deacon, and that's what I want to look at, a deacon. Uh, if, if we were to, to ask what the... And if you have a Spirit-Filled Life Bible, we're going to go to the word wealth in 1 Timothy 3. Uh, and, and actually, it's uh, uh, the word wealth for... No, hang on just a second. I think I did, did the wrong thing. Well, yeah, but I think I, I, I think I maybe grabbed something else, John. Hang on. Let's do it again. Deacons. Yep, 1 Timothy 3, 8. <clears throat> and uh, it says deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. So the word wealth down underneath about uh, where it says reverent, the word wealth says behavior that is dignified, it's honorable, it's decent, august, worthy of respect. Leaders in the church should set a good example displaying a departmental of the commands of respect. One, since Semus is used of both a husband and wife. See, in this place it's talking about uh, the reverence between a a husband and wife in 1 Timothy. But in Philippi, he's talking about the deacons. Now, so let's lay a little foundation without going real deep and in a long ways in what a deacon was. They, in the eighth chapter of uh, Acts, they, they chose deacons. Uh, or actually, it was in the seventh chapter. And then in the eighth chapter, it talks about some of the deacons and what they were doing. Does anybody know or remember from when in Acts what the deacons did. They were servants. They weren't running the church. They were servants to the church. They served the orphans and the widows. They waited, it says they waited on tables. And here's what happens when we remember that our position as believers, here, every one of us should be a deacon. Not, not just the, the chosen few. Every one of us should be a deacon because we should all be servants of one another, of the people that are in need. Now, no, I'm not going to say that. Yeah, I am going to say that. Sometimes we've got to be careful not to be enablers. Because sometimes the people in need are always in need. And we have to teach them how to come out of that place of need while we're serving them. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying just go, ah, they're always in need. I'm not going to do anything. But as we help them, teach them what the Word says. Do you know if somebody's sick all the time, it doesn't do any good for me to go and pray for them? Because they don't learn the word to come out of that place if I'm not there. Or you to go pray for them. But they don't ever learn the place to come out and to walk in divine health because they don't understand that by the stripes of Jesus we were healed. Well, it's exactly the same way when we're servants to somebody. We teach them what the word says to come out of that place. And so when I, when I say that deacons are servants... Um, we, uh, we don't become, we have to listen to what the Holy Spirit tells us so that we don't become a doormat. Does everybody understand what, I, what I'm talking about? Okay, so that's enough of that. But let's look at something else that it says. It says that de likewise the deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, given to much wine, and not greedy for money, Holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. So let's look at that mystery. I think even though this is, you know, where we've gone back into Timothy, this mystery is very important to Philippians and where we're going. 
and what a deacon should be doing. Um, mystery simply means a hidden truth. So how am I going to hold the mystery of a hidden truth? Mark chapter 4 verse 11 has uh, the meaning of mystery if you've got a spirit-filled life Bible. Uh, and, and this is what it says. Uh, to initiate into the mysteries. Hence, a secret knowing only to be uh, in itiner itinerated something hidden. Listen to me. Something hidden requiring special revelation. So where's the mystery come from? Where does special revelation come from? It goes on to say in the New Testament, the word denotes something that the people should never know by their own understanding. Why does a large portion of the body of Christ not understand the mystery? Well, because how can I understand it? By revelation of God. And I believe in order to walk in the joy that Paul talks about in Philippians, what I've got to do is I've got to get a revelation from God about what the mystery of the faith is. The mystery of the faith isn't you're going to hell if you don't change your ways. The mystery of the faith is knowing what is God's plan for me today. Because if God's plan for me today takes me in a place that I'm going to touch people's lives, then I have to know what the revelation he's got for me is. I don't want to walk in my revelation. I don't want to walk in my knowledge. But I want to have a rev special revelation from God. I, I've shared before about uh, my revelation of, of walking in divine health. Which doesn't mean that I don't battle with symptoms occasionally. But I learned to walk in divine health. It's been 18 years ago now while I was... I was puking my guts out. I wasn't well. I didn't feel good. Fact is, uh, some girl that I was married to 18 years ago told me that I had to get out of bed because we had a church service to do. And I tell you, I don't feel like getting out of bed. I started playing the guitar that night. And, 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 and I got to tell you, when I play the guitar, the sweat runs down my back because I'm not called to play the guitar anyway. I'm, play, I'm called to preach. But I was the worship leader in that, in that place too because we didn't have one yet. Actually, we never did. Uh, and, uh, it, and then... And, and I still felt bad. But when I started preaching that night, I've never been sick from that day since. But I could have laid in that bed. But I got a revelation. The Lord asked me, he says, even before uh, that beautiful girl that I'm married to uh, told me uh, that I had to get up. We, we had a church service to do. The Lord had already asked me, he says, how do you like this? And I said, I don't. He says, and why do you do it? Well, see, that was a revelation from God to walk into that place. That's not about me, but it's about learning to receive a revelation from God personally so that you can walk into a, a new place and a new understanding. The secret thoughts, plans, dispensations of God remain hidden from unregenerated mankind. Do you hear that? What's ungenerated uh, mankind? Your spirit man has been regenerated by the Holy Spirit when you took the breath of life or accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior because His blood causes regeneration of the human spirit. And that's what it says, is un, unregenerated man, uh, mankind, but are revealed to 
all believers. Non-biblical Greek muston, which is the word for mystery, is knowledge withheld, concealed, or silenced. In biblical Greek, it is truth revealed. New Testament muston focuses on Christ's sinless life, atoning death, powerful resurrection, and dynamic ascension. And what's packed up in all that? The power that you and I have on the earth today is packed up in that power that was in the ascension. Because what did Jesus said? All authority has been given to me. And I what? I give it to you. Okay, let's go back to Philippians. Everybody with me? You understand what the mystery is? How do I get out of the mystery? This, this is participation time. How do I get out of the mystery? Revelation. Would you say? Listen to the Holy Spirit. That's where revelation comes from. It comes from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come from the pastor and it doesn't come from the voice on the radio or the television that we listen to. And it doesn't come from the tapes that I don't care and I'm not going to name the the, the ministries that mail tapes or CDs every, every month. It doesn't come from them. I'm not telling you don't listen to them. But revelation comes. Where do you think they got the revelation? Where do you think I get the revelation whenever I get up and preach? The same Holy Spirit that is, lives inside of you that you have the ability to tap into to receive revelation. Somebody shout, Amen. Amen. Man, I can't believe how quiet y'all are tonight. I got to get back to my page here. All right. Great. Verse 2. Can you believe we only got through verse 1 so far? Now you know why we're only getting partway through the chapter tonight. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I think it's significant that Paul... Put, uh, put the King James up there for verse 2, would you please? I was going to just ask John to read it, but I think we need to. It is the same? Okay. So, <clears throat> so I want to point something out here. Did you notice that Paul either calls him Christ Jesus or calls him the Lord Jesus Christ? Every gospel that he, or every epistle that he wrote, he called him either Christ Jesus or the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that Lord means, is the name of the Father. Jesus is the name of the Son. And Christ is the representation of the Holy Spirit. So you've got the Trinity all in one. And when, and when Paul calls him Christ Jesus, like he did in, in the, the uh, well, the verse before he called him Jesus Christ, but, and then he called him Christ Jesus, I, I got to thinking about this as I was studying this out. And I realized that too many times we just go, well, Jesus. Jesus. And Jesus is the name that salvation comes in. But sometimes we take too lightly the name instead of understanding that there is no Jesus without the Father and there's no Jesus without the Holy Spirit. So the anointing that Jesus had came from who? The Holy Spirit. But what did he do? Did he do what he wanted to do? He said, no, I'm about my Father's business. And I thought that was, that's kind of a side note because, uh, b because as we look at this, I want you to understand there's no disconnection between the Trinity. And sometimes we disconnect Jesus from everything else because after all, it's the blood of Jesus. But it was the Father's plan. And it was the Holy Spirit that carried out that plan in that place. Uh... I thank my God 
upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine, making request for you. Excuse me, let me read that again. Always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all, or y'all. I always tell everybody that Paul had to have been a Texan, right? Let's go on. I didn't get it. I, I, I tried to give you an opportunity to laugh a little louder, but I did hear one or two. Making request for you all with what? Joy. Joy. How many times do uh, your thoughts of your brothers and sisters in Christ bring you joy? What happens if they're not acting just like you think they should? Or they're saying something that you don't think they should? Or they're doing something that you don't, don't think they should? How much joy do they bring you? Um, there are uh, a couple ministries that in times past has been uh, a couple hard spots between us. And my wife always says, well, we pray for them. Let's send them an offering. And all of a sudden, it just brings you joy. Because what would you do? You sowed a seed. Paul says, when I'm praying for you, you bring me joy. And so I think that's a really important thing. Sometimes when we're not walking in joy, it may be because we need to get on our knees. And knowing that we don't have to be on our knees to pray. But you understand what I'm saying. Sometimes I just need to go to the Father and let the joy run all over me. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day till now. Now there's two words right there that there is a, a word wealth for. And, and there's a star right there by, by fellowship if you've got a, a spirit-filled life Bible. And that's in, that word wealth is in Acts chapter 2. Verse 42. <clears throat> Did somebody say that's not me? Oh. I made sure I left mine off too. I left it in the car. <clears throat> anyway, go, moving on. Fellowship. It, do, do you remember what the word for fellowship is? It's the same word as com Communion. Konia. And what, 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 what does that mean? To have in common. So here's what, what the word well says. It says sharing unity, close association, partnership, participation. A society, a communion, a fellowship, a con con contributory help, the brotherhood. Konia is a unity brought about by self. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Do you understand the connection? You, there's, no, there's no joy without the Holy Ghost. There's no unity without the Holy Ghost. There's no... In Konia, the individual shares in common an intimate bond of fellowship with the rest of the Christian society. Konea cements the believers to the Lord Jesus and to each other. Okay, so that was one word. The next word in that chain, it said fellowship with what? The gospel. So that word wealth is in uh, Mark 1.1. The gospel, Mark 1, 1, this is verse 1, says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The gospel says compare evangel. See, the, the word is, is evangeline, is what the gospel is. In ancient Greece, evangeline designated the reward given for bringing good news. What kind of good news do you have to carry? 
I serve a God that I want you to, I want you to think about how you say this. Do I serve a God that heals? No, I serve a God that has healed. It's a done deal. It's already passed. I don't have to wait for it to happen. I serve a God that has already paid for healing. So, by his stripes I was what? Healed. healed. Okay. So, I don't serve a God. That, see, that, and that's one of the things that we think. Sometimes we think, and, and, and we're looking at evangel, evangeline. Evangeline, many times we think, is very simply preaching Jesus came and died for your sins. Let's, let's read on and, and see what it says. Greece, ev Greek, Greece Evangeline designated the reward given for bringing good news. Later, it came to mean the good news itself. In the New Testament, the word includes both the promise of salvation and its fulfillment by life death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ. Evangeline also designated, designates the written narratives of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So when I look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I realize that the message was, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. But what was the message? Greater works than I do shall you do because I go to the Father. The message was, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have been given, freely give. So all of those things are part of the gospel. When we look at the narratives, we don't get locked up in the place that we say, well, you know, we're just trying to save the world from going to hell. I don't want to just save the world from going to hell. I want to see... I'm turning my Bible off because I had to charge it against the wall because I got it out of the car and found out it was dead. Um, you know, it would have been terrible if I'd had to just pick up a paper Bible, wouldn't it? <laughs> Let me tell you this. If you see my preaching Bible someplace, please give it back to me. I haven't seen it for three months. Um, what, we, what we have to realize is God's plan is the fullness of the gospel. That's what the fellowship of the gospel is. It's not just a little bit. It's not just here and there. It's the fullness of what that gospel is. So when, let's go back to uh, Philippians chapter 4. I mean, ch Philippians chapter 1. If I can get the pages to turn like they should. Actually, I, I like to turn my Bible off because my wife's picture comes up on it every time I turn it back on. Okay, verse... Uh, Six, being confident of this very thing. You ready to run? I'm going to tell you, if somebody don't run right here, and I decided I'm not going to be the first one to run because I usually am the first one to run. Well, it's me or Sue, you know, so there you go. <clears throat> being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a work... A good work. He who has been good, begun a good work might complete it. Where? In me. See, it's not talking about the person sitting next to you. It's talking about you. It's not talking about the pastor. It's talking about you. And so when I look at that, what is a good work that he's begun? This is class participation. This is congregation participation. And, and uh, maybe I need to put a phone number on the internet so that uh, people on the internet could call in and, and participate too. No, you can't bring your phone in because it'll wipe out the internet and they can't, if they call in, we'd have a mess. I'm just kidding. Okay. In the spirit, call in in the spirit. Okay, I'll go with that. I thought you'd give me the answer. So he has been a good. Been, what is a good work? Do you, Do you remember the tithes and offerings 
scripture from Sunday, the very last verse of the, uh, I'll give you the number. Verse 8 of Psalm 138. And if I don't watch out, Kelly will put it up there to remind you, and I don't want her to do that yet. Which means she can get it ready. Does anybody remember what that says? He'll perfect that which concerns me. You know why Roddy remembers that? Because he studied it that afternoon. You know how I know he studied it? Because he looked in several Bibles and he didn't find it worded exactly like I said it. And so I got text messages. And, and I invite you to text message me. Don't be offended if I don't ask, answer you on Sunday because if I went to sleep, I turned my phone off. And my wife likes to take a nap on Sunday afternoon. So what's a good work? It's real easy to cheat and look because the word wealth's right there in the Spirit-filled life Bible. But what's a good work? He's going to what? He's going to complete a good work. Paul is teaching people here in Philippi that God's plan is for them to win, to walk in favor, to live in divine health, to have everything that they need. Remember in the introduction, why, why, who was Paul's favorite church? Not Corinth. It was Philippi because Philippi had fellowship with Paul, furnished, helped furnish his needs, sent Aphrodite even to prison to bring him the things that he needed, whether it was, you know, he probably didn't have a Walmart to go spend the money in. So he might not have needed money, but he had a lot of other needs, right? But it might have been one of those uh, jails where if you had money, you could buy things. I don't know. What Paul said was that, that Philippi furnished his needs. So, would you say that a good work is to furnish everything that you need? I'm trying to stretch your thinking here. I want to look at what a good work is. What is a good work? Well, you know, um, I take it as it comes. Um, let's see. Um, what kind, of, what kind of things do we hear every day? Well, you know, I just go with the flow. Man, I don't go with the flow. And I don't take it come, how it comes. And it's not easy come, easy go. What it is, is my God supplies all of my needs according to His riches and glory through Christ Jesus. That means that if I got symptoms attacking my body, what is my need right then? Is it money? So that I can go to the doctor? I'm preaching against doctors, but I'll tell you what, I like, I, I like the doctor much more than I, and, and I said this, and in fact, I haven't got over it yet, uh, Tom knows, because I talked about it at lunch today, you know, found out watching TV that I could, if I had this problem, I could take a pill that would keep me from having to get up five times a night to go to the little boy's room, but I could enjoy uh, the elevated possibility of prostate cancer. Um, diabetes was one of the things. Um, uh, bleeding ulcers, heart attacks, uh, you know, all these things. So, so if I got symptoms attacking my body, now I'm saying this for a reason. Because it's the doctor that's already healed me that I, that I have a need from. Not anything else. It's not that time that I need. And, and I'm not preaching against doctors, by the way. Just in case anybody by internet's watching and, and thinks I am or anybody here. I'm not preaching against doctors. Um, I have a doctor's appointment on Monday. In fact, I'm going for my yearly checkup so she can tell me that uh, I don't have to uh, take half the vitamins Kathleen had on the platform on, <laughs> on last... I'm stretching my faith right now. I'm telling you. Man, I read one of the vitamins she had up there I'd never seen before. I ain't taking that one. It said something about uh, so that you can age well. Man, I am a long ways from needing to age well. 
120 is a long ways from where I'm at. But let's look at this. Let's look at the, the meaning of, uh, of good, a good work. And I'm going to close with this. The word wealth says that uh, good in a physical. Now, I'm, we're reading the meaning from the Strong's Concordance. Not something I made up or somebody wrote. A good in a physical and a moral sense. Which produces what? Benefits. Shh. Man, I think I got a big imagination. Benefits. I guess I won't camp there. I'll go on. <clears throat> the word is used of persons, things, acts, conditions, and so on. And so, on. so what can you think of? I bought a, Kathleen and I uh, bought a house for my mom and dad, and she told me I was on a, a diet. Harvey will start grinning. He says, she said, uh, I can't buy any cars, and I can't buy any firearms. And I said, uh, well, why don't you just believe with me that God will give us more than enough. See, we serve a God of more than enough. That I can have all that stuff if I want to have it, even before that house is paid for. Amen. Now, it's again, it's not about cars, and it's not about guns, and it's not about, but it's what is it? That God, don't pat Wendy right now, Michael. <laughs> Do that at home. Not a good time. I know. I just picked on. I, I just picked on my beautiful bride. But what I want you to get a picture of is, what is a good work? How big is your imagination? How big is your need? Well, this is what I'm going to ask you. How big is your want to? Because the want to is like this. It's not about my want to being big enough to meet my imagination. My want to to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And all that He is... And all that he does is how big my imagination can be. It is not tied to anything else. It's not tied to how much money I have. It's not tied to how, big my, how, how good my checking account is. My health isn't tied to anything but how the Lord Jesus Christ sees me which also gives me the obligation of taking care of myself. That means that I have to have will when I walk through, the, through Walmart and I pass the Cadbury eggs because they are my favorite kind of chocolate this time of year. I can't eat all I want to eat. I can eat one. Sometimes. Otherwise... Never mind, let's leave that alone. <laughs> Do you get a picture? Do you understand what I'm saying? Your imagination being big and your willingness to walk and follow God doesn't give you permission to max your credit cards out and let Him pay for them. It doesn't tell you you can eat all you want to eat and not pay the consequences of being too heavy. It doesn't tell you that you can't, you know, all, and we, got, we got to look at this thing. The Word gives us the place. I thought about this if, if you uh, reflected on anything that Kathleen and I talked about the temple together on Sunday. Actually, all she talked about, and she, she showed three or four books, all she talked about is the way that God planned for us to eat to begin with. Because it's here in the Bible. Not, not in that book. It's just we don't read the Bible enough to figure out how God wants us to eat to take care of all those things. Because he said, I gave you every, she read that, I gave you every good, how is that? How does that tie to a good work? God will complete everything. It goes on and it says good in an aesthetic sense, suggesting activeness. 
and excellence. I serve a God that is excellent. I serve a God that expects me to be excellent. See, he doesn't expect anything out of me that he's not willing to do. And I don't expect anything out of him that I'm not willing to do. But I expect everything out of him when I look at this word and I just do it. Father, we thank you right now for your word. Father, I thank you for how Paul saw that when we walk in fellowship with your gospel, that you will complete everything in our lives. And Father, I thank you for that. I praise you. I give you glory and honor and power in the mighty name of Jesus and by his blood. Amen. Amen. Remember, Jesus loves you and so do we. As you've watched today, you've had the opportunity to hear the word preached. And as you apply that word, you'll get victory in your life. But it has to start someplace. It has to start first with a commitment to Jesus Christ as making him your savior and then making him the Lord of your life. Paul said this in Romans 10, 8 through 10. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Well, the word of faith that Paul preached is found in the next verses. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with a mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with a heart one believes unto righteousness. So it goes like this. All you have to do is actually say, Jesus is my Savior and he is my Lord. So I'm going to invite you to say this with me this morning. Uh, and if you want to bow your head, you can bow your head. The Bible says that pray watching. And so it's okay to keep your eyes open and, and watch. But let's say this together. Say, Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I confess those sins today. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of those sins and to come into my heart and be my Savior. And I commit today that I will make you the Lord of my life. Thank you for salvation today. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you said that today for the first time, no matter what time of the day or night it is, uh, welcome to the family. Welcome to knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now from this day on, make him the Lord of your life. And as you make him the Lord of your life, you will find out what God can do in you and through you. Also, if you've watched this broadcast, we want you to know that you can become a partner with this ministry. As you become a partner with this ministry, some of the things that you've seen throughout this uh, presentation, uh, the buck outs and, and things like that, then you become a part of that kind of ministry. And there's many people that come to know Jesus. We have offices in Nigeria and Togo, have four churches in Nigeria, one in, in Togo. And uh, we want you to know that you become a part of each and everything that this ministry does when you become a partner. You can see the information right there on your screen so that you're able to become a covenant partner with us. And as you do, we want you to know that we pray over each and every one of your offerings so that God will multiply it back to your hands according to his word. His word says in Luke 6, 38, that he gives back, pressed down, shaken together, running over to make room for more. The New Living Translation says whatever measure you use in giving large or small, it'll be used to measure what is given back to you. So we want you to know that God loves you, He'll take care of you, and he'll multiply the seed that you sow in this ground with this ministry. Remember that Jesus is Lord, and Jesus loves you, and so do we.